Hey everybody, so today we are going to be doing a quick start guide on indexing. You might call this subject indexing, you might call this cataloging, although this is definitely not a tutorial on traditional cataloging. You also might call this keywording or tagging in general. And a lot of people have to do this. A lot of people don't realize that this is something that they are going to have to do for their job. So while this is a good quick start for those who are wanting to learn a broader understanding of indexing, certainly can watch this video. It's going to really help you. This video is really going to also focus on folks that don't necessarily need to know all of the tricks of the trade. They just really need to understand how to do this well for the small projects that they might be working on. So I am going to walk through with you with some fictional uh, documents. So this is going to be textual based indexing where we're going to go through and we are going to use Agrivoc, which is an agricultural open source vocabulary. And the reason I'm using an open source vocabulary is so that if you do wanna follow along, if you do wanna go in and just do a Google Scholar search and find content to do some practice indexing, you'll have the taxonomy to go along with it. Ideally, you would be really comfortable already with the taxonomy that you're going to be using. In this case, I don't actually use Agrivoc very often, Although I am very familiar with it on the linked data side, I don't actually use it that often to do uh, indexing with. So we will be learning together on this. All right, so with that, let's go get started. All right, so let me walk you through what we have here. So we have Agrivoc set up. They do have a search engine, which is great. You can look through things with the hierarchy as well as alphabetical. Over here, I have my sample search results. One thing that indexers are really good at is being a subject matter expert on whatever topical or whatever discipline or domain they are going to be indexing with. So here we're going to be talking about plastics in the environment. The first thing you wanna keep in mind when you are doing indexing is who your end users are. Are they going to be engineers where they might be searching for uh, codes to these documents instead of actually doing keyword search? Or are you dealing with the general public on the open web where they're going to be putting every kind of combination of keyword in to try to find information? It really runs the gambit, but you really need to understand who your end users are so that you tag appropriately. The other thing to keep in mind is how your search engine actually works. If this is just a general Google search, it's going to look at everything on the screen. Whereas if you have an enterprise search that may be calibrated, see my other videos on how to calibrate your search engine with taxonomies, uh, that can maybe be pointed to the subject tags more often. Now, most of the time this metadata, hopefully, is going to be um, input into a content management system, a CMS, or some other kind of asset management system uh, so that you actually can put your good work into use after we're done here. Okay, so this is how you start to do your indexing. You're going to first look at the most valuable pieces of information first. Usually that's the title. Okay, so plastics and the environment. So I usually go through and if I'm not familiar with the content or the taxonomy, I start to pull out keywords. I think environmental factors would be important for this, but we already have environment and environmental factors I have seen quite often in indexing, but what does it actually mean? It's not very meaningful. So that's the thing you wanna think about is the search engine is already going to be able to pick up on the strings of these things uh, in, in the text. So you don't necessarily have to regurgitate what is already in text. You really want to use your brain as a human to understand if somebody were looking for this article, what, what is this article essentially about? That is really the, the, the main goal of indexing, whether you're doing it with machine learning, by the way, or if you're doing it with humans. You want to get the essentialism, right? This is an actual way of doing indexing, essentialism. What is this essentially about? So here I've started to pick out some of these keywords, but let me stop here and just read through what this article is essentially about. All right, so this is telling me that the main, the main oomph, the main focus of this, this article or this book, I don't know which one it is, 
uh, is how plastics affect the environment. So, you know, effects on environment. And environmental factors affecting plastics. So, okay, here environmental factors does seem to be a key indicator. Now I'm going to switch over and I'm going to look at my vocabulary. So here I've got plastics is obviously something that we need to consider. So plastics. Okay, so first of all, if you have a content management system that uses IDs or URIs or something, that's fabulous. Definitely use the codes instead of the strings if you can. So I would go ahead and use that if I was actually using a system. Because I'm talking to all of you, I don't really want you to have to go and look all of these codes up, so I'm just going to use the string. What else do we have? Uh, recycled, let's see. Recycled. Okay, so here now we have to make a decision. So we've got recycled materials, recycled paper, recycled plastic, recycled wood. Well, we know this article is mostly about plastic. So even though when it was describing recycling and recycled, it didn't say plastics, we know that's what it means. That's what the human indexers are for. So let's grab recycled plastics. All right, effects on environment. So let's this one's gonna be a little tricky since I don't know this taxonomy very well. So let's see if it even has anything with effects. Okay, effects by itself is something. Vectors and effects. Okay, well, let's try effects. What does that have to say? Consequence or outcome of an action. Yes, of course, okay. Uh, if we look over in the hierarchy, right, we can go in and check out if there's something else that we could use. Dosage effects and residual effects doesn't really help us out a lot. So maybe the effects on the environment isn't something that's really going to help us here. So here's where we have to step back and think to ourselves, okay, what do we have at our disposal in this taxonomy? Because environmental um, effects on the environment is kind of ambiguous. So what kinds of um, effects on the environment? Well, we do see in our, our tags that we're talking about energy recovery, fossil fuels being used. So maybe those are the kinds of, of effects that we're having. So we have, let's see, fossil fuels. Let's see, I look through and I look at anything else that I might be able to use instead, but I decide on fossil fuels. Okay, this is nice that it has a definition. So it does tell you what it's about, this is probably what you're looking for. Environmental, let's see. Oh, it's got a lot, okay. Uh, accounting, temperature, auditing, ecology. Let's go, no, changes that might, oh, environmental factors. Okay, cool. That's one that we might wanna use. Environmental contamination, which is pollution. Well, I would think that pollution is one of the effects on the environment. So let's keep that one also in mind. All right, so let's go and check out environmental impact and see what that has to do. Okay, any alteration of environmental conditions or creation of a new set of environmental conditions, adverse or beneficial. Okay, I think this is spot on. So even though it does not say effects on environment, this is where human indexers, whether you use human in the loop when you're doing machine learning or if you are training on machine learning, this is an important piece where the taxonomy term does not necessarily match what the author has in their description. This happens all the time. And if you're not looking at your machine learning well uh, in advance of these issues, so you could have incorrect or, or missed ones. So here we're going to use environmental impact because we are humans and we know that that is a good one to use. And we did see another one in here that might actually help us with environmental factors. Um, I believe it was actually environmental factors. There we go, we got environmental factors. So we've got environment covered, right? Now the reason I don't add environment by itself is because we have other things that are talking about the environment that are more specific. 
when you have more specific tags, you always want to use those more specific tags. So we're going to say that one's covered. Uh, we did already get, did we get recycled? No, not yet. So we'll, we'll get to that one. Oh, no, we did. Recycled plastics. Okay, so we have recycled plastics. Effects on the environment. We did that. Environmental factors. We did that. Resource recovery and energy recovery. So let's go see if we can find anything about recovery. Doesn't seem like we're finding anything for this one. What other words could mean recovery? Well, let's go and look what the hierarchy has to say. Okay, so we're looking for something that means recovery. Processes. Properties. Let's see what's in here. Well, something like sustainability might perhaps cover this. So let's go and look at sustainability. Ability of a process, human activity to meet present needs by maintaining natural resources and leaving environment good. It's close, but I think it's the, the context here is a little different. So we're going to pass on that. All right, so what I am seeing here is I don't see anything that really talks about energy recovery um, or resource recovery, but I have to think to myself, recovery means that you can then reuse it. So is there anything talking about reuse? So if we really thought this was a very important aspect of this article, I would try to find a a topic, a subject that would be a good tag for this. Um, otherwise, I'm going to leave it off because these two things do show up in the text. So it would still show up if you did a keyword search. Okay, so let's go back and look at our, our tags. Also, if you wanna put these in as uh, suggested terms because they don't show up in your taxonomy, that's another good approach that you can use here. But we're only going to look at the ones that we have access to. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six tags, which is good. If you've watched any of my other videos, uh, there is a, a sweet spot for subject tags, and that is between three and 10 tags. You certainly can go over or under that amount if necessary, but make sure there's a really good reason. That's usually the sweet spot for anything that's topical. Now, um, for those that are used to cataloging, you might say, okay, well, we want to make sure that the uh, author is, is grabbed, Sam Wells. When you're trying to determine whether to add um, a product type, some kind of um, code, or a personal name in your actual aboutness, right, your subject tags, your metadata tags, uh, you really want to think to yourself, is anyone going to use that information to find this article or this asset? And if they are, does your search engine already accommodate that kind of search? Then you do not need to add it. It's already in the search index because it's part of the metadata. All right, so this looks good. Now I'm gonna do a double check and I'm gonna say plastics and the environment. Uh, I'm going to look at the abstract at the time and say, yep, yeah, check, check, check. I got it all. This tagging seems good to me. If I struggled, if I needed to find some additional context for any of these, you did notice there were some definitions, which was great. Um, I could also go into my own assets, the content that's already been tagged and find out, how do other people tag content with that topic? And that'll give me some indication on how I should also use it. So this is a standard. This is going to be a little bit different because there's not a lot of description to this thing. So we've got a title, Standard Environmental Tolerances for HDPE. What's that? I might not know. That's where you go to Google, where you go to your company, uh, you know, data catalog and find out what this means if you don't know. And then here's a, here is a code. So what I have learned through my own experience is if there are codes for documents that are commonly referenced in regulatory uh, information, you should have that in your tags. It's most likely not something that's going to be in your taxonomy because you would have a million different tags for a million different types of 
um, IDs, but this is something that your engineers or your scientists or you know people that are just very familiar with working with standards, they're gonna know those standards. I know ISO 25964, right? I know that number because I use it all the time. This will also show up in your search index. So you may not need to have it in your metadata. The reason you might want to is because sometimes standards will say this standard does not cover uh, EPA 1254, or it will say this standard is a uh, companion to EPA 1254. So they do often intermix um, references. So you, you might want to actually add this to your tag so that you can actually find the content that's actually that, uh, that, that standard instead of finding everything that references it. Um, although those references are really great to have um, elsewhere in your metadata. You know, the bodies of water, what kinds of bodies of water does it cover? Um, what is the amount of water that it covers, that sort of thing. In medical taxonomy, uh, the location that this standard or this article covers, that's important for standards and regulations because different, different geographics will have different pieces of information that you have to have in your documentation. Let's say a big time manufacturer that will ship your, your product out to many different uh, countries or um, even geographic regions in the United States, you need to understand what the rules and regulations are for all of those. So that's really good to have here. Okay, so EPA 15254 or 1254, sorry. I will grab that, that's gonna be a tag. Now this is not in our taxonomy. So this is something that you might have a separate field for uncontrolled terms. I really, really get nervous when we have an uncontrolled or miscellaneous or something that's not as, as structured, especially when you're talking about tags. But in the case of standards, it sometimes is necessary. Uh, guidelines for HDPE, we know that that is high density polyethylene. Okay, so let's go look at our taxonomy. So let's try HDPE first. So HD, HDPE. No results. Okay, let's try the full word. No results. <laughs> so then I say, okay, so this is talking about high density poly, uh, polyethylene, but does it know polyethylene? Let's go check that out. Maybe that's my access into this kind of topic. Ha! yay. Okay, now we have something. So I don't know what a poly polyethylene film is. So let me go with polyethylene first. You can see it's a chemical compound, so that's where this hierarchy really helps so you can get more context. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any kind of description. What I do understand that is used to make, so that is more of an, ont of an ontological or knowledge graph relationship, because this is linked data and it is used in knowledge graphs. Uh, so this is really helpful to me because I can think to myself, okay, if polyethylene is used to make a polyethylene film. Does that mean this is the raw material and that the real product, the thing that is probably floating around as a plastic, the film? I would probably wanna go in and look at the rest of the content in my corpus that talks about this to be sure of that. I would also wanna make sure I go and do some additional research into this topic to be sure. But already done those things and I'm going to say yes this is accurate so as much as I want to have the true topic it's not in our taxonomy I would put it in as a, as a suggested taxonomy term because you can see it shows up in at least two of my uh, articles here's another rule of thumb when you are adding a new taxonomy term again this is a rule of thumb it does not mean it is a rule that cannot be broken you have certain situations where you will break these rules but generally speaking, if you don't have at least 35 documents talking about a specific uh, subject, and when I mean talking about, I'm not just saying offhandedly talking about, like this thing, this one I have right here, this last one uh, on the screen, it is about high density polyethylene. So that is an about, that's 100% what this thing is about. This would indicate to me that if I had at least 35 of these, 
or things that are this heavily concentrated on this topic, I should add it to my taxonomy. If these are the only two articles that I have talking about high density polyethylene, I would not add it because it's not important enough to continue to maintain it if you do not have enough content to support it. I am going to put this document up in the description below so you can go in and add your own tags and see how you do. All right, so when you are actually doing the act of indexing and tagging, you are using something called literary warrant. And I'm going to have a whole nother video on exactly what literary warrant is. But basically, this is one reason that machine learning is so powerful when you're doing indexing is you saw that I had to make a lot of judgment calls as a human. And that's, that's really good. That helps machines learn. That's why people are always needed in machine learning projects. However, humans are about 91% accurate when they are doing their indexing. That's really good, but they are very inconsistent. Usually less than 50% of indexers will use the same tags. Now, that's not necessarily something that's going to wreck your search engine, but that is one perk for going with machine learning. You still have all of that beautiful knowledge that you're getting from your subject matter experts making those decisions, but then you're teaching the machine the consistent way to make that decision so that if one indexer has a bad day and they forgot something and they just, you know, didn't add the same tag that they normally do, machines don't make those kind of mistakes. However, machines do make mistakes. They definitely do make mistakes, but they make them consistently so that you can find them and fix them. So this is just something that I wanted to point out because I truly believe you cannot do machine learning, especially automatic indexing without people. But you also want to think about how to make things more consistent. And sometimes machine learning is just a tool to help you achieve that. All right. This whole thing is hopefully going to help you understand how to use indexing yourself. If you are one of those people that are doing it, I know there are a ton of Mechanical Turk jobs on how to do indexing or how to tag machine learning training sets. So if you are watching this video, go check those out. You can make a decent amount of money on the side by doing that. And this video will help you with that. Or if you're just somebody trying to get involved with more indexing and just understand it better. All right. And with that, I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.